I weirdly love cartoon food stuff. You know, like, what is a Krabby Patty? I yeah. want to try it. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hazel. Today on the show, Matt is catching up with novelist and TV writer Jean Kyung Frazier, author of the 2020 novel Pizza Girl. What did Jean have to say? Yeah, Anna, I really enjoyed talking with Jean, who I met on Instagram during last year's NBA playoffs. She's a Clippers fan, I'm a Nets fan, and we had a lot to discuss. But really, I enjoyed her book, Pizza Girl, and we talk about how she writes about food in her fiction. We also talk about her upbringing in Southern California, the food, the hoops, and how Pizza Top of Pickles plays a critical plot point in her work. Here's Matt catching up with Jean. And make sure to visit tastecooking.com for our latest stories and recipes and to sign up for our newsletters, which drop on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Jean Kyung Frazier, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I read Pizza Girl, I think, right when it came out, and I just uh, I had such a good time with it, and we can get into the book. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to hear first, though, I want to hear about your home cooking experience growing <laughs> up. What was it like growing up for you? Gosh, it's actually a very fun and interesting question, one that I haven't been asked in all the inter- okay. interviews I've done. No yeah. one's asked me about home cooking, but... Yeah, I grew up my with my both my mom and my grandmother, like her mother in the home. And so my mom was always so busy working. Like she really yeah. has only become a cook later in life. And that's yeah. been something we've kind of been doing together, which has been really fun. But growing up, it was my grandma who cooked all the meals and a lot of both like traditional Korean meals, but also mm-hmm. like she was just a very creative cook in some ways mm-hmm. too. I don't know. Do you like eat much shin ramen? Oh, absolutely. Shim, the best. shim yeah, like shim with, with, with uh, American cheese on top. That's my guy right there. <laughs> I have never tried that. I'm going to, maybe I'll go home and do that. But no, we, um, my grandma though, since it's so salty, she would try to save half the packet yeah. and she'd put it into like a, like a little jar or something. And then she would use that seasoning on like um, ground beef or like eggs and stuff like that. So she's always doing like fun things like that. A Gene, little, that's such a cool yeah. story because I've heard this from folks where where those packets are being reconstituted and put mm-hmm. on rice or put into yes. soups and uh, other dishes. So totally. What's your so so? Do you have like a hierarchy of chige and tongs? Do you have like <laughs> a favorite two or three that you that you eat or cook? You know, it's so weird. It's like, I mean, and I was talking to my mom about this. It's like, I feel like I've been having to, like, rediscover Korean food because, like, my grandma died, like, I guess, like, six years ago now. And I just have never really – I don't eat Korean food if I'm not at home, you know, and I haven't been home much. So that's why – we were talking about Eric Kim when I walked in here. It's been such a joy seeing him, like, publish his sort of, like – it's fusion doesn't feel right, but, like, very, like, home-cooking Korean – American meals on the New York Times. And Absolutely, so well, we, he's a guest on the show, and he, yeah. he was, I believe, episode seventy-one, and and um, he talked about that a lot. About it's not mm-hmm. quite fusion; it's his lens. It's the yeah. you know the Atlanta lens. You grew up in Southern California, yes, I did, L.A. So, area, L.A. area. Yeah. So, and and in writing Koreatown, you know, we went to L.A. For the most. Mm. So, what in in your in your words is is L.A. Korean food like? I mean, it's like the fried chicken focus is very heavy. Like funny enough, I guess, well, I'm sure my mom knows this. When I was like 16, we would go like Korean places traditionally just don't give a fuck. Am I allowed to swear on this? You can totally swear. I should have asked you before we started. Well said. uh, Great. But (laughs) anyway, like Korean businesses particularly do not give a fuck about drinking age. And so we would come in when we were like pretty young. And it's just like the height beer and fried chicken is like what I think of when I think of high school and like the flavors that like. I think of when I think of L.A. Korean food. Um, other things, like weirdly, have you been to – there's a lot of Ethiopian spots in Koreatown too. Yeah, definitely. Which, like goat stew I weirdly consider very Korean because I had it a lot yeah. growing up. But yeah. Wait, what was the question? I'm getting no, like lost in my No, story. no, really good answer. I, and we were just talking about <laughs> Southern California Korean. And, oh, yeah. and in your book, in Pizza Girl, you, mm. you kind of weave in – 
food, uh, not just from the title pizza, but also <laughs> Korean food. So when you're yeah. writing about fiction, writing your fiction yeah. and writing a food scene, mm-hmm. um, is it challenging to get the details right? Or are the, the details less important than the actual drama on the page? I've, I've always wondered this. It's a good question. I mean, I think like first and foremost, yeah, it's like drama is important, but like to like texture a scene and layer it, like it's, it is important to get those details down because like, I think what's fun with fiction is that you every reader's imagination is different. Yeah. So if I say, like, I don't know, let me think of, like, an example, like, I don't know, like, miyokuk, like, yep. the tr- uh, Korean, like, sort of seafood beef stew. Mm-hmm. Some people, that might evoke the smell. Others, it might, at the very least, get them interested in, like, what is that? And they might look it up, and their world might be expanded a little bit. So there's just, like, a lot of fun you can have, I think, with food, whether it's, like, triggering sensory detail or just making someone curious and hungry. <laughs> That's, do you eat miyukuk on your birthday? I do. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I actually tried to make it like last month because I was like, I don't know, I was feeling a little lonely. And yeah. sometimes when I, you know, when you get lonely and you just start thinking about all the sad things yeah. that have ever happened to oh, you. And yeah. I, anyway, I was thinking of my grandma and she would always like growing up, that was something, a dish she would make when I was sick on my birthday or even just like a cold day. And so I asked my yeah. mom for the recipe and it did not turn out right. I got to work on that. Uh, well, you will get there, <laughs> I'm imagining. And yeah. and so my sister-in-law, Maya, bought me your book for yeah. Annika and, and I... I uh, I read it quickly. Uh, she owns a pizzeria Thank in, you, Maya. in Jersey. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. she was like that book rules. Yeah. Um, and she owns this pizzeria, and you know, I've I've gotten to know a lot about pizzerias through her mm. and how the, the culture of working at pizzeria. Right. And you set your characters in a pizzeria, mm-hmm. uh, and the way that um, they interact with the customers, the way they interact, the indifference, the right. ambivalence <laughs> towards the job, because it is frankly a low paying job in many yeah. cases. My question is, Is yeah. did you have experience with pizzerias before you wrote the book? or Did you research them? Mm-hmm. Well, I I worked at a it's, – it's, it sounds wrong to call this place a pizzeria because, like, they had pizza. But especially <laughs> compared to um, Maya's place in Jersey, it's probably nowhere comparable. But, yeah, I worked at a pizza sort of wings – any greasy food you can imagine yeah, they had. Yeah. But traditionally, I, I did deliver pizza there for one summer between my sophomore and junior year of college. And it was definitely, like – I still look at it as one of my favorite jobs in oh, some good. ways. Or really perfect for what I needed at that time, which was, like – to be alone in my car driving around, mildly stoned, making a little bit of money. And so, it, yeah. yeah, it really – I wasn't thinking about writing about the experience then, but always looking back, I was, like, very struck by, like, the cinematic nature of it and just, yeah. Yeah, and especially the way you write about Southern California. Oh, thank you. I feel it has um, the sprawl nature of it. Right. The way that you write, you construct the, the neighborhoods, the subdivisions yeah. – it's just really great. I oh, think it's you. a real talent of yours. Oh, that's so nice of you. Yeah. Um, I will say this. Um, p- uh, pizza topped with pickles mm. is a <laughs> is a device in the in the book. Right. And I don't want to spoil it because right. you should read it yourself. But what is it about pickles atop pizza that compelled you to make this part of the plot point? Right. Yeah. I mean, we can give away a little. Like, so sure. the first line, I knew I wanted to start with, like, her name was Jenny Hauser, and, and I wanted to, like, I was like, what is the perfect way to end that sentence? And I was like, it's something very intimate and specific that the pizza girl does for this customer. And for a while, I was playing with, like, her cutting the pizza into weird shapes, but that didn't feel quite yeah. right. And then I remembered with that I had been... Um, driving through South Dakota and I'd stopped at this bowling alley and they had pickle pizza and it was fantastic. And I was like, oh, it's perfect too because like there's a Midwest component yeah. um, with that character. And so yeah. it just, and it sounded great. Her name was Jenny Hauser and every Wednesday I put pickles on her pizza. And it, it is just took a off great line and good story too. I've never had, I'm from the Midwest myself and I've never had pizza mm. topped with pickles, but I feel like I need to try it. Yeah, I think it's best with white sauce personally. My friend yeah. had made me some the other day. Yeah. Um, the other day being a year ago. <laughs> time, what is time? What is time? Um, but it was quite good with white sauce. So we um, ask fiction authors. We often mm. interview nonfiction authors and journalists who work in food, but we right uh, are really blessed with fiction authors once in a while. And we ask them our – we'll call it our fiction author questionnaire. And Let's I wanted it. to get get some of these questions down because – I just like how fiction and, and nonfiction collide a lot mm-hmm. and, and food is often um, a device in fiction. Right. So let's talk about uh, your favorite grocery item you uh, you bought recently. What's what's an item favorite that you love? Favorite grocery item? Like something I like use yeah, often? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've been like mostly – I mean it sounds – hmm. I don't know if it's a grocery item. Like does like an herb count? I've been buying a lot of – 
a lot of herbs. Shout, yeah, yeah. Let's do herbs. What, what, what yeah. are you thinking herb-wise? The big ones, I've, well, I've been making my own little simple syrups lately. That's like the domesticated thing I do, and I hope to only make more. And so I've been making a lot of thyme and rosemary simple syrup, and that, it's pretty light. I, I think that's a – I would say that more of a, a, a DIY project right. category, but yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. Okay, so a thing you cooked – you cook at least once a month. A thing I cook at least once yeah. a month. I'm a meat person. I think I do make myself a good steak once a month. Nice. Are yeah. you ribeye? Are you more grass fed? Like I like tenderloin? a ribeye. Yeah. Nice. I, I'll like I'll like play around though. Like so, Succession is back, and so me and yeah. my roommate are going to make a steak this Sunday. Interesting. Like, Great show. <laughs> yeah. we probably had a lot of thoughts on that yeah. one. When when the mic's off, we'll try. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Favorite food scene from a book, movie, or TV? <laughs> this is a fun one. I I feel like it might be weirdly um, Devil Wears Prada. When he makes that grilled cheese, he yes. crunches it in the Jarlsberg. I've never had Jarlsberg, yeah. but I, I think of think of that scene often. It has like Jarlsberg as a cheese mm-hmm. um, for a grilled cheese is it feels a little demented. Yeah. It feels like it shouldn't be there, <laughs> but it probably is pretty good. Yeah, I got to try it one of these days. I think I'm trying to think if there's any other. I weirdly love cartoon food stuff. Yeah, you know, like what is a Krabby Patty? I yeah. want to try it. Yeah, <laughs> these made up things. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you write for both television and and you have books, but the yeah. toughest food to capture on the page. Mm, toughest food? You mean like to evoke or to like describe? It's a good question. So it's up up to you. But let's just mm. say to describe. Hmm. I think it often is like like if you're talking about a dish more complex than like a steak and potatoes and it depends if you want to go into depth with it a book that actually does it really well better than mine for sure is the margot affair by Mm -hmm. sanai lemoyne Mm -hmm. um she used to be a food editor too and so there are there's Mm -hmm. literally like uh, stuff i read in her book where i've like tried to make it as a recipe and it's like great like as simple as like pasta and bacon and like a little bit of like oil and stuff a little bit of tomato it was like incredible and so she really did a good job of describing yeah. like the act of making it but also like making it sound like sexy and good what a cool description of a yeah. book and 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 i feel like when you write like the the recipe out as a non-recipe it's very yeah. challenging to do that and totally, totally good call okay a ritual food or drink that helps you get through your work so something that <laughs> you know you're stuck on a scene or you're mm-hmm. stuck stuck on a closing line mm. and you need a snack as we all writers we sure. oftentimes need snacks what is it for you um well i'm a big Lacroix gal i um i feel like my work table especially over zoom it which is it starts <laughs> like just collecting cans everywhere like a little village and stuff like that i think the fun thing about new york it's not necessarily a specific thing i just will go walk to my bodega and i'll buy like a tea or something like that yeah. that feels like clear my head a little bit get a treat go back to work. I love that. Yeah. I love there's like the little luxury of going yeah. to a a fancy bodega and yes. paying way too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like paying like got like $8 for mm-hmm. some kind of CBD or yeah. THC or whatever you may be yeah, exactly. drink, you know. <laughs> no, totally, totally. Um, do you have a favorite cookbook? Favorite cookbook? Hmm. I love, you know who I love? I love Maddie Matheson. That guy is fun. And his cookbook was like, I mean, especially if you've watched his YouTube channel, it is generally like you think of him, you think of like his big lasagna or some of the more like munchy food. But he's like a very well-trained professional cook. And so there's like these beautiful broths in in one of his books. I think it's Home Cooking is the one that a friend got me and I liked. Good call. I think Maddie is somebody who gets kind of framed as that like vice munchies, as you said, Um, action Bronson, you confuse the two, which is unfortunate (laughs) because Maddie is a real chef, as you said. I love his cooking. It's totally, yeah, truly. I like keep flipping to it. Like now that it's like soup season as well. Yeah. I'm definitely going to try some of his broths out. Yeah, nice. Okay. So what about you? Like, you know, do you have a dream cookbook that you'd like to write yourself? Dream cookbook? Yeah. I feel like I want to do the munchie cookbook. Did you ever do, (laughs) I used to in college would do, if you get the little like bags of Fritos. Oh. You pop them open and you put chili in the bag. Little cheese, little jalapeno. Frito little pie, baby. Yeah, exactly. That's some uh, chili Frito pie. There we go. You, you, you head down to Austin, Texas or Houston. <laughs> exactly. You're going to exactly. find that at every menu. I love that. Totally, totally. We used to have a camp. I used to go to camp and they called it Haystacks. <laughs> haystacks? Did you That's ever hear that? No, I didn't. I loved that, though. Uh, it was it was awesome. It was as a, like an eight-year-old or nine-year-old. Huh. I loved it. Haystack day. Love that. Um, well, thank you for taking the questionnaire. Of I wanted course. to ask you about your time in TV, in the TV world yeah, and, 
And you are writing for a show called Beef, which is a Netflix show <laughs> yep. in combination with A24. Mm-hmm. And it's starring, it, it, this is what I read, so correct me, it's Stephen Yeun yeah. and Ali Wong. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, that's them. What a I know. ridiculous duo. I Amazing. know. I, I, I'm telling you, I really like, I remember I, I interviewed for the, sh- like with the, my, who ended up being my boss. Yeah. I interviewed with him and we got off the call and I felt this terrible feeling in my chest and stomach. And I was like, oh no, I really want this job. Yeah. And I hate really wanting something. Cause then it's, I mean, you know, the flip side of it is like, when you don't get it, the pain of that is so great. So yeah. I was like, oh no. I was like, I haven't wanted something in a while, but luckily it worked out. And the show is just, I'm, I'm so excited about it. We just finished uh, the room a little while ago yeah. and we're going to be shooting in the spring. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And so if you shoot in the spring, it's going to probably be out next fall. Yeah. Something like that. We'll see. You know, I don't know that stuff, but no. I've done my job. <laughs> you did the writing. So yeah. did you ever get together as a group or is it only Zoom, your writer's room? We only did Zoom. But I did get to meet them um, a couple times, which was really nice. And it's so fun to see how people translate in Zoom in real life. I think I, I give off shorter energy over Zoom and then yeah. people meet me and I'm like 5'10 and that's always mildly shocking. <laughs> so now I warn people. That's cool. I mean, <laughs> do you did you go out for any meals as a group, as a team? No, we, did, I, we didn't. Well, we got pizza one night, which was fun at John and Vinny's in yeah. LA. I was in LA at the time and that, yeah. was, that was really nice. But no, just a wonderful group of people, and I'm really excited for everyone to watch the show. So, do you have you written a lot for television? Is do you have writer mm-hmm. writers room experience and stuff? That's my second room I did. Cool. Um, my first room, weirdly, was Law and Order: Organized Crime. Sick. Yeah. Okay. Let's it was an go. interesting one. I, I no, I I think it was a more fun experience than I thought it would be, just because it's not something traditionally I've watched or would go for. But you know, as the pandemic. Uh, the job came up and I met some like really brilliant writers on that show. Are you a proce- procedural fan? Not really. That's why it was like, I think the joy of working on that, because like, you know, I mean, weird political issues with police aside, like yeah. I, it did feel like I was discovering a genre for the first time. Like I'd never really watched procedural except in like a doctor's waiting room or something yeah. like that. Yeah, well, was, that's probably why they hired you, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I think, yeah, I think I brought a lot of, they wanted some char- more character work done because this iteration of it is less typically procedural. It's like serialized, okay, which I is see. why it's like really different. So, um, yeah, I feel like it really helped me though just as a writer to like think about plot in a more firm way to outline a little bit more instead of the sort of uh, crazed willy-nilly approach I've yeah. taken to writing. So That's yeah. my approach. Good first job. Outlining yeah. is such a hard thing oh, to it's, do. Oh, it's now now I'm such a fan of it. Now I'm just yeah. like I'm like let's outline, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Did you uh, were you able to put any any interesting deaths onto the page at that show? <laughs> interesting deaths? Uh no, not in okay. my episode specifically. Okay. But there was some like badass kind of mob stuff going on yeah. so that was fun I love Chris Maloney too he's just the coolest yeah the real goat when it comes to the, that yeah. series um, <laughs> well that's cool I, I'll look for beef I, I can't wait to see it yeah. and uh, what about your fiction so what can mm-hmm. we talk about are we are we are we in book two yet are we yeah in... yeah I'm, I'm gearing up for book two and I, I think for a while I wasn't sure if I wanted to do my stoner tragedy or if I wanted to do a basketball novel, I'm trying to find a way is if there's a way to do both. And I think there might be Yeah. not the basketball novel I picture, but I think it will fit in really nicely with the story I'm doing. And there's a lot of there's there is a lot of that sort of like good kind of food like in this book, too, more than even Pizza Girl, maybe. So I'm oh, I, I, I love <laughs> I'm a hoops fan myself. And I wanted to segue to that question oh, about the NBA season. But first, did you <laughs> did you check out Eddie Wong's basketball sh- movie? Did you no I haven't boogie right yeah boogie. yeah yeah I've been meaning to I heard there's some good food scenes I think in that one too, it's a huh? great yeah. movie I yeah. love Eddie's Eddie's a it's a dope dude and oh, I really so cool. like that movie yeah it's 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 a I gr- gotta it's check really it good. out yeah um it, it, I think there's just definitely a genre around basketball mm-hmm. um yeah. and food and going out after games for yeah. food oh my gosh I have so many memories of like where we would eat after we're done with the tournament. Even though BCD Tofu we would go to a lot, actually, 24 hours. Yeah, I love that spot that on, 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 uh, on Wilshire. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. exactly. I would, I would go to a lot of Knicks games early on. I'm a oh, Nets cool. fan. Um, yeah, yeah. So fuck the Knicks. But, <laughs> but well, before the Nets were Brooklyn yeah. Nets, I was a Knicks fan. I used to go to K-Town a lot. Oh, cool. After. Love that. I was I, the, BCD is one of the first places I went post-pandemic. or I mean, 
we're still in the pandemic. We're that sounded here, weird, but, but like as restaurants opened up more, I'm in. Yeah. I love that. I hope you do that 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 book about basketball culture and and yeah. I love that. But I want to hear about the NBA season. So you're a Clippers <laughs> fan, right? I am. I am. My mother was just not about spending a lot of money to go to Lakers <laughs> games when I was a kid, and then they won my underdog heart over very quickly. So yeah, I've been I've been a fan for gosh, I guess forever at this point. That's a great story. I feel the <laughs> Nets and the Clippers are 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 like brothers yeah. from another mother. Definitely, definitely. Um, um, I got a lot of Clippers fans in my life, but yeah. what's the, so let's close. Mm-hmm. What's the prediction for the Clippers this year? Ooh, I think they could go all the way. I really do. But you know what? I say that I've say, I feel like I've said that like every year for the past eight years, and they've just found new and inventive ways to rip my heart out every year. <laughs> so I'm trying to be uh, optimistic this year, or like let, cautiously optimistic. It's an exciting time for NBA, though. Like I oh, mean, yeah. like. Last year we had a final of like Phoenix and Bucks. That's so cool. Bucks are unstoppable. Yeah. I feel. Yeah, Phoenix, I could see a repeat. I could, I could see, see a repeat. A repeat. Yep. I could see the Lakers making a run. I'm never going to count LeBron out. <laughs> I'm so interested how him and Westbrook are going to play together because they're both so like ball dominant figures. Yeah. So we'll see. Gosh. Yeah, I think I think uh, Westbrook's too high usage for that team. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and then you've got Davis with his health issues. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of question marks there. I feel like the Nets on the Nets side, it's it's definitely their year. Yeah. Kyrie Irving in or out regardless yeah with James Harden and and Kevin Durant clicking yeah I mean they're they're the best they're the best have you read Boomtown by Sam Anderson by I'm the way? going to that's like one of my favorite books uh, for people listening it's this really intriguing nonfiction book about technically it's about the Oklahoma City Thunder but it yeah. really is like just sort of a history of Oklahoma City yeah. and like why it's one of the most interesting American cities ever and I, I just I love that book it's fantastic I I need to check it out a lot. Yeah. so many people have recommended yeah, it yeah I'm sure <laughs> I love the like, way a sports book can, t- can talk about more than sports yes like really big life stuff yeah um, like in that one this one's pretty wild like the Oklahoma City bomber like what a tragedy apparently he was a huge Buffalo Bills fan and like he lost a lot of money betting on the Bills and you know so you're just wondering you're like oh my god like fandom does push you to like weird places sometimes obviously that's a simplification and like he talks about in a more interesting way but it is a a character detail I did not know about that guy what a what a psychological profile yeah and and with legalized gambling now I feel like we're entering an an era that's maybe untapped and unknown oh my god I'm horrified I used to bet on football with the security guys in my at my old office building yeah uh, I I like I like those guys but I'm glad I don't bet anymore (laughs) yeah let's uh let's keep it Let's keep it at just a fan. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan for the love of the game. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Gene Kyung Frazier, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Matt and I are here in the studio today on a very brisk, very dark day here in Manhattan. Matt, we have a long winter ahead of us. We do have a long winter. You know, Little House in the Prairie had a book called The Long Winter. It was like the <laughs> third book in the series. It was definitely not my favorite one. Little House in the Big Woods is probably my favorite. But it makes me think about The Long Winter a lot. When I think about that book and I think about what's ahead of us, we have a long winter ahead of us. And certainly a big part of this long winter is the cooking projects we will be undertaking. So, Anna, how do you define a cooking project? I love a good cooking project. You know, to me, a good cooking project, especially to get us through the kind of cold winter months, is something that you can learn a little bit from. Sometimes I even like to almost give myself a, like, lesson plan Mm -hmm. for the winter, set a few cooking goals, a few skills I want to pick up. Cooking goals is great. I like that better. It's like you have these goals, like squad goals, but really cooking goals for this long winter, you want to learn something from it. Okay, I, I'm following you here. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, it's like springtime and you've picked up this new awesome skill. You're like, you come out the other side a, <laughs> a bigger, better person. It's like you're in one of those water slides and you're like spit out and it's like April and like I have all this knowledge about cooking now. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, that's what a winter's worth of cooking can do to you. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel like this this winter project cooking is is kind of the culmination of the of the year when we collect cookbooks, we we have authors on the podcast and we collect these these ideas like I need to do this or that. And like life gets busy. Life is extremely busy and you can't really um do that project when you're not um, you know, forced into your house by like a 17-inch blizzard, right? It's um, so true. I mean, I have like a, a notes app, like yeah. a notes 
running all year long that's basically like the whole list of things I want to cook. And then it usually hits like a time around now, like November, December, where I finally get to to the list. Definitely. So one of mine is inspired by uh, the new book Pasta, which we've we've talked about a few times on the podcast, and it's Missy Robbins and Talia Baiocchi's new book. Um, I'm not really a pasta maker. I just like don't feel like that's that's like my uh, my my natural instinct isn't to like get that get the crank out or get the KitchenAid out. But what I'm thinking is I want to uh, master um, definitely one of the stuffed pastas, probably the egg melody, which I've had at Lilia a few times. But really, it got me thinking, and this is kind of a little bit of a detour from their text, is I have this dish, Anna, that I had as a child. It's called cannelloni. Oh, yeah. You've of heard course. of cannelloni. It's something called manicotti in, uh, in the States. That's like the U.S. Italian-American version is manicotti. You buy these manicotti tubes, they're called, and you stuff them with cheese. I grew up eating uh, this cannelloni dish, this spinach cannelloni at a restaurant called La Fontanella off West Main in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I want to figure out how to do that dish. I want to, like, recreate the La Fontanella manicotti. You know what's so great about restaurant manicotti? I'm wondering if your particular reference is this way but like when it comes in a little personal baking dish and it's been like baked for you know to serve I love that it's so important and right and it's like you know it's like an enchilada comes with that layer of cheese that if you knew how much cheese that was it would likely be a bag of cheese that you bought off the shelf and you're like that would be really crazy but really that's how much cheese it takes to get to that level so that's mine. What you give me one? Give me one of yours winter cooking projects. Okay, one of them is that I recently made kimbap for the first time. Um, I was using a Yunjo Park recipe that's actually in my upcoming book about tinned fish. Ooh, shout out promo alert! So Yunjo's recipe is so cool. It um, takes tinned tuna and mixes it with goju chang and mayo, and kind of rolls it up in shiso, and then you incorporate that into a kimbap. I think that's such a good idea. I I've not I've not tried I've not made kimbap in a while, and it's such a really it's such a good dish. To, it's so to good, and making that recipe made me want to try more, and um, cool. really to just get really good and uh, expert at rolling the rolls because it it takes a little practice. It takes some practice, yeah. Yeah. What about you? What What's next on your list? You know what? I've been thinking a lot about Thai cooking at home and how much I love the, f- the food of Thailand and, and, and Thai American cuisine. Satsum Dur in New York City, Riem Pear in Los Angeles. I, I mean, Pok Pok, of course, the OG. I, I think about all these restaurants and I've moved to a, a part of uh, the Hudson Valley that doesn't have a lot of Thai uh, options, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to gonna cook some things this, 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 this winter. A couple dishes that I want to try are larb. Lab, you could say it as well. L A R B is like the romanization of that of that term, and it's usually um, a chicken or fish that's been minced and 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 infused with citrus and herbs. And I want to like make a larb that feels like I'm eating at Ruan Pear in Los Angeles. Um, also, I want to attempt khao soy, khao soy, the, the, the the rich noodle dish that is. Um, found throughout Thailand, but um, I believe um, uh, I, I believe it's in the north. I'm not I'm actually sure of where it comes from. Do you know? I, are you, are you I f- think it's from Chiang Mai, but I could uh, be wrong. Uh, uh, okay. But yeah, khao soy is so good and it can be intimidating to cook at home because it's like such a rich, flavorful broth. Yeah, Leela uh, Bina Ratapun um, is an author that's written a lot for taste, uh, both about Thai cuisine and, and, and non-Thai cuisine. And I looked at her books um, to help me um, get there. I feel like I, I might – I'm just really, like, not familiar with Thai cooking. And I think this this winter will be – that will be one of my my goals. So what about That's you, awesome. Anna? What else you got? Leela's blog also is great. She, she simmers. simmers. Yeah. Definitely it's, agree. It's a really awesome resource. Another thing on my list is Esteban Castillo's choco flan recipe. Yeah. Okay, so choco flan is this crazy act of gravity defying kind of like baking magic where you take a bunt pan that you've like greased pretty carefully, you fill it halfway with chocolate cake batter. 
And then on top of that, you add kind of like a dolce de leche flan mixture. And as it's baking in the oven, the cake batter and the flan mixture just switch places. So when you actually cool it off and unmold it, it's like chocolate cake on the bottom and then wow. a topping of, of flan. It's so cool. It's like a magic trick. Yeah, it's like a magic trick. And I would love to cook it sometime this winter. Is that going to be for a party? Is that going to be for an event? Do you have something happening in, in Feb, in March? I don't have anything planned, but I feel like this is the kind of project that, you know, I could plan something around. I could say, like, hey, friends, <laughs> let me come over for dinner. Yeah, I love that idea. <laughs> What's next on your list? I have the word nixtamalization written down, and I was uh, talking to you, Anna, before we, we, we hit record, and you're like, you're going to start up a nixtamalization, you're going to do your own <laughs> masa at home, and I was like... You know what? No, that's not what I'm, that's not what I mean. Think big, think ambitious, <laughs> right. though. Think ambitious. No, I think there's plenty of places that you can buy fresh masa, uh, and I think my goal is to make a corn tortilla from scratch. And you know, you can use masa harina and and buy mesteca or like Bob's Red Mill has this. This is like the the masa flour, um, the corn flour where you can you can, it's like instant and it's a little bit um, it's shelf stable and it has it, you can make plenty of good tortillas with that. I might actually do that. But for me, I want to go to the extra step. I want to find a f- place where I can buy fresh masa, and I want to press some tortillas and maybe make some carnitas or something. Maybe uh, you know some nepales or something. I'll do some some kind of cool taco or I don't know what else. Maybe enchiladas. So that's one of my goals: a fresh taco, a fresh tortilla. That is. The, or maybe even a tamale too, actually. I might even make a tamale. But I also want to master nachos, and Javier Cabral is working on a story for taste, and, and by the time this airs, it may have run or not. We will include it in the show notes if, if it has run. And he is going to basically give me some intel on, on how to make the best nachos in the world, and I want to do that. That is a pretty big promise, best nachos in the world. I think that's the slug we put in our editorial calendar, best nachos in the world, or maybe there's something better. But Javier has a lot of theories about it, and so it's been laid down. Are you personally more of a, like, make queso and then drizzle it over the nachos person, Uh, or are you more of, like, a buy shredded cheddar and sprinkle that over the nachos and melt it? Definitely the the second the second option. I'm more of, like, a blanket of, of industrial cheddar cheese. But I want to know also, like, how can I use, like, spice and pickle and acidity correctly? Um, and how much cheese do I need? And and really, I think there's, like, a sauce or something involved in it. So we'll see. Yeah. And it's, like, always a balance of hot and cold, too. Like, which, yep. which ingredients do you want to be, like, piping hot, fresh out of the oven? And which ones do you want to add later? It's really interesting. I, I, I have a lot of thoughts about nachos. And we that story will really capture it. Anna, what else do you have? My other, my last cooking goal is to make a bunch of pizza because <laughs> nice. this summer I actually got a one of those countertop convection ovens. Cool. Because I live in a little rental apartment with a terrible oven, so finally I have an oven in this little countertop convection oven that can get really, really hot. And I can't wait to try it with some pizzas. I can't wait to maybe have a pizza at your, at your house and invite myself over. Yeah, sure. Hey. We'll well, hang. I've got, you know, I got a couple of these little, like, Detroit-style pizza pans. Oh. So I am excited about all the possibilities. Pizza party at Anna's house. Yeah, totally. So how about this? Let's regroup in the spring. Right around the time, uh, you know, the seasonal Reese's are hitting the shelves. That will be our <laughs> signifier. And let's come back to the podcast and talk about what we actually did in the summer or the winter and what we're looking forward to in the summer. We will have a progress check with Reese's. All right. Well, this is great. This has been fun, Anna. Yeah, it has been. In the meantime, listeners can head to tastecooking.com for more winter cooking project ideas. Thanks for listening. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Heasel. The show is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Our theme music is by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste Online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening. <laughs>